Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, a section of uh, uh, Project One, Dent 1158. Uh, so what we've done so far is we made some custom trays, we made some occlusion rims, gave them to the dentist, and the dentist has therefore uh, taken registrations. And uh, it was probably a very lengthy appointment for the dentist, as well as uh, the custom trays. Um, so we'll receive these, uh, let me just get these down a little bit more, there we go. We'll receive these back from the dental office. If they did a, uh, let's say an admirable job, these occlusion rooms should be intimately contacting. I see a lot of days in the laboratories, they come back just with the bite registration and that opens the bite or they're filling in the gap of the occlusion rims rather than getting these occlusion rims to intimately contact in centric relation. So you have a centric relation record, which is a relationship between the lower jaw and the maxilla. Uh, and then we're going to put teeth in there and, and create centric occlusion with prosthetic teeth. Um, so what we should have received back from the dentist, and I'll just simulate here, is, uh, I missed one thing here, is the midline which you can see here is marked. Uh, the cuspid line, which is usually, you know, the ala of the nose brought down depending on the smile opening. And the midline's brought down onto the lower. Hopefully the practitioner did the lower as well. So when they're getting the patient to practice opening and closing, that when they bite down on the registration material, they haven't slid over one way or the other. So uh, even myself as a denturist, I'll have them marked both here as well as the canine lines I'll bring all the way down and have the patient uh, practice a centric relation position, uh, which we're you know, deeming an you know, unrestrained position with the head or neck of condyle in the glenoid fossa, the most retruded position. Because this denture is not just for, like we said, mastication, but we're rehabilitating the TMJ as well. That is most likely kind of migrated forward over time, especially if we lost an, lost an anterior stop. So this is the way it should come back from the dentist. I leave the models usually a little bit thicker before going for bite registration. When they come back from bite registration, then you know uh, we may have models in this angle. It's imperative before mounting that you trim the models very close to parallel to the plane of occlusion parallel to the occlusion rim. The occlusion rim is parallel to the ridge. It's imperative that the rims are parallel to the ridge. The ridge is parallel to the base before going out. Then it goes out to the dentist. They'll change the plane of occlusion with a fox plane uh, to get the allotragus line, uh, tragus of the ear, ala of the nose, or campers plane with the use of a fox plane, and then they would proceed to take a face bow record. Face bow record transfers the position of the maxilla in relation to the condyles, so we can transfer it to our articulator, which I showed you last week. Third registration is uh, before, the, the, the third one is actually centric relation. So we have face bow record, we'll do a protrusive bite record. And as you can see here on my occlusion rims, I'll bring it a little closer, there's a, a four millimeter roughly line behind the canine lines. So I'll have the client move their mandible forward, just put a little arrow there, until this line meets this line. Then I know they've moved protrusive enough. I don't want it to come all the way around where the condyle will slip outside the articular eminence and then to, like, some people can even dislocate the DM, TMJ. So, Facebook record transfers the position of the maxilla to the condyles. Protrusive bite record to program the angle of the condyles. Good enough guess with the protrusive bite record. It gets us closer. And then the last registration is centric relation. And as you see these uh, rims, I've had really sharp uh, uh, chevrons on the top and then uh, squares on the bottom. It seems to be standard treatment. I even know this, they do with denturism because I used to teach over there. And this is so when this registration falls around the box somewhere, I know which side is which. I don't have to fumble around too much. And then it has a good locking device here. As you can see, that's like firmly in place. 
and they, when I put them together, it is locked in place. Now, when it comes back from the dental office, like I said, I would go to mount the models. How are we going to mount the models without a baseball record? Because I want to, you know, we're, we're kind of skirting between academics and reality here. Dentist is not going to give you a baseball record. Uh, they might even be surprised if it's articulated in a semi-adjustable articulator. But we are going to use a semi-adjustable articulator to try to simulate some group function balanced occlusion in our denture setups. So once we have our occlusion rims returned from the dentist, we trim the base of the model. We can separate the bite registration. We're just working with the upper model now. Uh, I will go to key the model. Now you can key the model in many different ways. If you noticed, I did trim my base already. And I'm also thinking of uh, this step over here, if I can bring this into the picture. I'm also thinking of this step, of how high my denture is. I don't know if last year you go in here and all of a sudden you got teeth sticking out of the flask. Well, not that your denture has so much vertical dimension, but possibly the base of the model was yay thick. So always anticipate what's going to happen. I'm anticipating my setup, so I'm parallel to the rim. The rim I started parallel to the ridge for the dentist. They uh, labial contoured for lip support, buckle corridor support, midline, canine line, smile line. Smile line will help us choose the length of the teeth. If I was to simulate, you know, a central here, a lateral here, and a canine there. It'll give us the width of the teeth, and we're going to talk a whole uh, lecture on tooth selection. But I've selected the teeth for this project for you already, and we're going to practice manipulating the wax. If you haven't noticed already from your custom trays and your occlusion rims, manipulating the wax and having it work in your hands very quickly and efficiently is probably the most uh, training that you can gain here from George Brown is repetition of handling the wax. Also plaster and stone. Uh, if we can't handle the wax in an occlusion rim, we're going to have a very difficult time handling the wax in a denture setup. So like I said, I trim the bases once I get them back if they're not equal. Doesn't have to be perfect, but very close. Base, plane of occlusion, base. I started at 22 millimeters and 18, and that might be, uh, when I go to the dentist, it might come back 20, 16, 22, 19, depending on the vertical dimension from the plane of occlusion that the dentist had uh, previously prescribed. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'll get back to it again. I'm going to separate the two. I'll move the lower aside. I'm just working on the upper. We have to key the model. I notice uh, some of us, they key the model, and we're doing these crown and bridge keys like this with the Vs. Difficult to get a nice articulation because plaster will come out through, ooze through the V and on here. Okay for crown and bridge. Yeah, but for dentures, if we could just use the base of the model, and then you will use an egg burr and give me like... Uh, let's triangle or tripodized three kind of uh, uh, grooves here in three different directions and this will be enough to anti-rotate the model from remounting it's also not deep enough or sharp enough that'll break when I dismount to invest and also not sharp enough that'll break when I'm divesting from the flask after processing I need this all to separate so I'll be back in one second I'm just going to trim that in there The whole idea of mount of, of these keyways is so we can remount to the articulator to check the bite. Uh, or if the model falls off from, I don't know, boiling out or, or something, it just boil, it, it separates in shipping or something, then we can remount it either a little glue or something or some wax on the base. So here is my keyed model. Now I have to get that model in this articulator without a face bow. So I've asked you previously uh, to make a jig. And this mounting jig is an average value mounting jig. Hanau has made one. I think you see one, uh, a graphite one that I have. But uh, I asked you to make this jig that you can use a lifetime with your articulator. Keep it. Make two. No, okay, don't make two. <laughs> and this here is an average value. We have to trim this, this base. Some of us are painstakingly working hard 
to trim this base to the plane of occlusion that matches the upper member and the lower member. Now this angle here is probably the best line to be, but if you're slightly below it or slightly above it, that's fine. Let's just get a flat plane. I think our puck maybe have been just as shy or this one I trimmed too much that I grabbed. Regardless, this here is gonna give us a better fighting chance than just sticking it in with plaster scene and Dixie cups and what have you not. Keep in mind, this is an average value mounting and we're gonna mount the models within Bonwell's triangle, which is the average values of the midline of the centrals in relation to the condyles to the midline. You can see there's a little hole here where we unscrewed our, our uh, Frankfurt tool here at the top, we unscrewed it. This hole here is about 110, actually exactly 110 millimeters from here. And then if you look down, I've even put a little dot down here on the base. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to line the dot, which is obviously the middle of the articulator, regardless of if my plane is off center a bit, that dot is very important to me. Let me just see if, let me check my dot again. It's a tiny bit, no, it's good. And I'm gonna put my midline right on that dot there. And then I'm gonna articulate the upper member only. Now this could move around with plaster or whatever. And I don't wanna ruin the other registrations if I have any, but what I can do is I can just take a tiny, 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 tiny heated instrument, a heated instrument. This will also tell you if your base is of the model is flat. You can, if this is flat, then the base is flat, and then this should be flat, or very close to. I mean, we're not gonna sit there all day measuring micrometers, but very, very close to. Hot spatula, I can just seal it maybe in one or two spots without ruining midlines and what have you not, and try to center it, like I already looted, but we don't wanna like have the midline and then it's over there. <laughs> this is not gonna work. I mean, get the midline straight through the midline if you can visualize it down the midline of the upper member of the articulator. Now let me go back and seal that again. So you can heat up your instrument. Don't add wax. There's enough on the occlusion rim without ruining the registration. Don't heat up the registration that uh, you've received. And maybe just ever so slightly. There. That's looting the model. Then the next thing I'm going to do is uh, proceed to articulating the upper member only. And again, this is average value mounting, Bonwell's triangle, and then that line down from the side is the Balkwell angle, which you'll see in the presentation is 26 degrees. 26 degrees down, angled forward from the plane of occlusion upwards to the um, condyles is the Balkwell angle, 26 degrees, I believe. 24? No, 26. Now, the plaster, you decide if you mix it thick, it'll set faster. If you mix it thin, it'll water all over the place. I think it's very useful to make sure that you add just a little bit of water to the base. If the base is very dry, it'll absorb all the water out of your plaster. It'll absorb all the water out of your plaster and then not give you a nice seam or, or a nice seam between the plaster and the stone. So, you know, this might be a little bit remedial, but these little things make a difference, I think, in the in long. If your model's dry, just a little bit of water. It'll soak up this water that I'm putting on here, just so I can get a nice uh, interface between the plaster and the stone. You have to get crazy about it, as I just did. A little bit of water. My model's been sitting a while, so it was very dry. And then I'm gonna mix up some plaster to the right consistency. Sorry for the delay, mine was a little bit runny. And this is practice about what consistency you wanna use. You want it too thick that when you close the upper member, the pin won't close down. And you don't want it too thin that it runs all over the wax. But you have lots of time here, and I'm only doing one articulation, so it's not that difficult. And I need a little bit of displacement theory here, how much I'm gonna add. I've already visualized 
you know, how much space I had there from my articulator. And before I close it, I might want to run the plaster to the edge just to avoid any voids here afterwards. I don't want to open it after I've already closed it, right? So I've actually gone all the way around and closed the seam between the stone and the plaster. And then I'm going to close the member. If you want, you can see there's undercuts here. If you really want to be sure, I guess you could do this. Uh, I haven't been... Uh, I don't think I've done that, but I guess you could if you wished. You could put a little bit in there in the grooves just so you don't have any voids, but most of the time the plaster will just go in there. And then I'm going to close it down. And there we go. I'm going to take some plaster off here. From the outside. And take your time, don't rush. If it's crazy in the plaster room, wait till it doesn't get crazy in there with people. And you can use your finger if you want. I try to use the spatula as much as I can. I don't like getting my hands all. And I think the problem areas or the difficult areas are right underneath here under the upper member and I'll get a void there. And as you can see, try to make it look presentable. So I'm exposing the mounting plate all the way around. Some people cover the mounting plate. I think it looks kind of cool to expose the mounting plate at an equal amount around here. Let me look at the back of the mess I've made back there. And I'll take the extra off there. So there you have it, the upper member mounting in Vonwell's Triangle average value mounting on the semi-adjustable articulator. Because this is, we want to simulate uh, the client as much as we can. And after this sets, which almost is, then we'll go and we'll move to the lower one. Just give me one moment. So with the lower one, what we need to do, I mean, I didn't set, I didn't loot this too much, but that's set. I can take the upper, the, the mounting jig off for another case. I can reintroduce my occlusion rims in centric relation. I can, oh, look at this. What am I missing here? So I've keyed the model. I'm going to put my centric relation record back together. Back together, I said. I got a little bit of plaster on the, uh, from my hands here. I'm trying to do it in one take with the video. Now here what I'm doing is I'm sealing the base plate a little, just very slightly together the rims and to the base. So I've sealed the occlusion rims to the model and I've sealed the occlusion rims together. Even though I have the silicone there, I don't want it to move. Just tacked it. I can double check. You can see this is very close to the front of the mounting uh, table here.
very close. So you got to be careful that we kind of angle that forward. I'll put a little bit on my, I've turned it upside down. I'll put some on the base of the model. I'll seal the seams between the model and the plaster. Sorry, my hand got in the way. Again, use judgment how much I'm adding here. I gotta be careful not to hit the incisal table on the way by. And then over to my mounting ring, which now I'm fully closed. I can angle this forward. And while I was talking, my plaster was setting. But I think I can manage to smooth it off. And this side here as well. Let me just go over and clean that up. I'll be back in one moment. Okay, thanks for waiting. It can be a pretty messy job, this articulating, uh, especially if I'm trying to talk and do it away from the plaster bench here on the, uh, on the workbench, but uh, those are just excuses. I used a little towel here. Um, it's very imperative now, I use that word again, not to get any plaster on the base of the model. And that seam is nice and sharp for remounting. And once it's set here, it's relatively smooth for presentation. If you find this is really tight in the front here, then you can trim the front of your model before you articulate uh, the lower model. Now, I am ready now. I've mounted this average value mounting without a face bow in Bonwell's triangle with the midline down the center of the articulator upper and lower member in centric relation and now i'm ready for the tooth setup so stay tuned uh hopefully everyone get to this stage uh you know by midday and then we're going to start off by setting up the anterior six teeth first uh and i think i've chosen mold r47 the anterior teeth now for this case will be in Class one occlusion. I'm the dentist, I'm telling you, class one occlusion with the most standard bite of one millimeter over bite and one millimeter over jet. So if I would try to go over that from last year, if I draw my anterior tooth here, this is from the cross section. Let's zoom up a little bit. This is a cross section. And again, this facial plane is probably about 10 degrees into the sulcus. Do not go outside the sulcus if your occlusion rim is, hasn't been altered uh, labially for lip contour. So we've got the sulcus of the model, if I can kind of do the ridge here. And we've got the incisive papilla somewhere around here. And usually this distance is, you know, three to five millimeters anterior to the incisive papilla, the facial. These are averages. Naturally, women would be a little bit further because they have more atrophy by 
average is. Uh, they might be four to six, seven millimeters uh, anterior to the... Uh, uh, so women, let's say, uh, we'll do men three to five, women four to seven at the most. These are averages. But this here is a telltale position uh, that this sulcus here, where the attached and detached goes so right at the outside of the sulcus, this would probably be the, the, the most labial extremity that we're going to do here. And my central has some wear facets already. <laughs> and then this is a cross section. We're going to set up all six teeth in, in, the, um, in the correct position is a review from last year. And before I get to that review, uh, I'm going to draw the lower here. If I can try to be a, a great artist. And here we have a cross section of our lower mandibular teeth, which are more straight up and down. And this anterior tooth is canted off slightly labial. I would say 10 degrees, just like our bite block. And this is more straight up and down, and this is right on the ridge. These lower teeth won't go off the ridge at all. And again, never past the sulcus of the model here. Uh, if we get outside, then we have instability of our lower mandible denture. And even if the uppers are out here, well, then it's a class two. I see too many laboratories trying to stretch or technicians trying to stretch every case into a class one. So it works. There's only so much you can stretch out here for labial lip support prior to Botox. This contraction of the uh, facial muscles and obicular sores will dislodge the upper member down or upper denture out. Conversely, the mentalis muscles at the front, triangularis, riasaurus, once they're contracted, orbicularosaurus, will lift the mandible denture up. Especially we don't have any ridge support if this is getting flatter down here. And then we'll talk about posterior tooth forms, which will help us gain that stability. But this conversation here is about the overjet, which is this direction. Please pay attention right here. This direction here, the horizontal overjet and the vertical overlap or overbite. So we've got one millimeter overbite and one millimeter overjet. This is a cross section of our denture setup. Some of us might have the teeth out like this. Some of us have them retroclined like a class two div two. Let's not do that. Let's see if we can just set up the six anterior teeth at the plane of occlusion of my bite block. Remember, your bite block of the upper is right here, right? This is the bite block of the upper. And it's already had labial contour with the right angle. And I'm putting the central right in there on the cross section. If we have too much overbite, what will happen so when the mandible is protruded, and I see this all the time in most dentures, because naturally a natural looking smile would be a lot of overbite. Myself, I've got 85, 90% overbite for my age, and some of you in the class have 50% overbite. And you're getting there, where the lower anteriors are up under here, contacting behind your upper centrals on the cingulum. That's a more natural looking smile. But in dentures, we can't have that overbite, definitely without implants. We can't have that overbite because once the mandible goes into protrusive, and this is the most important movement that I'm always checking first. When we have this protrusive movement this way, these lower anteriors must just miss on this angle because we have an angle here. Remember this? This is the condyle. And I think on this case, we're doing 30 degrees or something like this. This condyle will protrude the mandible uh, downwards, even though the upper member's moving because it's not our articulator. And we'll just miss these anterior teeth. There's no posterior teeth here. This is what we call group function, where the mandible condyle, or down this glenoid fossa here, where the, the, the condyle's in here, going down the anterior wall of the fossa and the TMJ, will guide the mandible downwards, not necessarily a straight line because there's a little articular eminence in the center of our anatomy, if you remember. We'll go down the anterior wall and we don't want the teeth interfering. So the condyle is what's going to dictate the protrusive movement, not the teeth. Really, not the teeth. The teeth, if the teeth are conducting the movement, then those forces are directed down onto the alveolar ridges, maxillary, and mandibular, causing extreme, extreme 
uh, pressure, atrophy, sore spots, mobility, uh, and, and tissue trauma for sure. Now, this here, this little page diagram in a nutshell says a lot about our setups here. This is where the student's going to make the biggest mistake. There is no contact of the upper and lower teeth. There's a millimeter. What is a millimeter? Don't forget. Okay, if it's a millimeter and a half, that's fine. But can we try for one? I always say one because you give me three, right? I mean, there's three there. One is, that's just one. That's very small. Not even in size of edge. When this, this is the whole basis of group function. This condyle moves the mandible forward down the anterior wall here that these teeth just touch, but don't collide. They touch. Or I remember dense fly, whatever, say they kiss and they miss, or whatever silly nursery rhyme you want to make, the kiss and miss. But they, they do not collide. They just contact each other. Very gently, they're just contacting each other. Conversely, in the protrusive movement, we'll get to the posterior teeth. Uh, probably next week. But we always talk about, you know, 20 degree setup, which this is very close to it. And it's a cusp fossa occlusion. Or, excuse me, it's a cusp marginal ridge occlusion where this upper tooth contacts the marginal ridge of the lower, if I draw and simulate two bicuspids here together, one tooth to two tooth occlusion, the cusp, marginal ridge occlusion. And then we have these angles, these buccal line angles. These buccal line angles hopefully will be synonymous with the condyle guidance, will hopefully will be synonymous with the anterior guidance. This is just one protrusive movement. We haven't gone left lateral, right ladder for working and balancing. We're just picking apart two things here of Hanaus Quint, which is uh, the basis of group function. So for today, anterior setup, anterior six, lower six, stop. Do not go any further with 12 teeth. You can even get your first upper anterior six checked by the staff here, and then we can move on to the lower six. Then stop again and check it again, because if this is wrong, this is, this, is, this is just a waste of time. This here has to set you up for uh, success. And then next week we'll talk about the position of the posterior teeth on the ridge, on the lower, and we'll talk about the balancing contacts left and right. But one thing to gain from here is we got 30 degrees here. We probably got 20 degrees here. We probably got 10 degrees in the anterior guidance not really adding to 30 but we need these to work synonymously the teeth are made now for different situations partial dentures acrylic partials full dentures implant dentures so sometimes we have sometimes pretty much all the time but not with some experience first is that we may alter these buccal line angles to get a smoother uh, guide forward left and right with articulating paper if we do it all at the wax try-in, we know that there'll be discrepancies when we're processing, uh, when we're processing the uh, denture that we'll have to remount uh, the models and uh, recalibrate the occlusion slightly for um, with articulating paper and make maximum contacts and centric relation or centric occlusion with the teeth there, and then uh, the proper contacts balancing left and right. Now, we know that there'll be some discrepancies from uh, shrinkage from the split pack technique. There's also uh, remounting airs here, remounting airs here between the upper member and the articulating paper. Uh, we know that... Um, there's errors in the remount, there's errors in the shrinkage, there's errors in our wax setup even before going to process. And then, you know, we're getting crazy about a quarter millimeter with all those errors that are already included. So once we get very close, I think I'd be an advocate along with many other people that we'll take it to the patient's mouth 
and get the true mandibular movements and the fine articulated movements of the mandible will be adjusted at the chair side. That doesn't mean leave 10 millimeters of plastic or teeth for the dentist to adjust, but there should be some chair side adjustments with the, with the patient because these are just average values of 30 degree condylar guidance and uh, the teeth, you know, are that, you know, after being punched out of those molds over and over and over again, there's slight discrepancies of those too. So this is the goal for today. Uh, mount, set up the top six and the bottom six. When we're setting up those six upper teeth, because I know you're going to start that next, we had to review last year a little bit in your textbook, even chapter eight in this textbook, and especially our Vita Denture Setup Guide, which is useful. Uh, that if this is my midline here and my plane of occlusion, that my centrals here I'll just try to simulate the tooth here are pretty much straight up and down and if they aren't they might have a slight angle to the distal a slight angle to the distal laterals naturally are off the plane of occlusion I think this gives it some aesthetic appearance Uh, females, maybe slightly more. Males or with attrition would be even. Now, here's something kind of funny. I mean, I learned this when I was in the dental technicians. It was, oh, this is youthful. Well, my client's 70. I mean, I have more attrition on my anterior teeth from grinding than this. So maybe we go flat on the plane. But so try not to make this too creative here. Now, with females, maybe some overlap. If the patient's right-handed, they're right-side dominant. Right? There's never a mirror image of left and right. right. We always have one eye dominant, we have one arm dominant, we have one side of the face dominant, and we'll have in our smile one dominant. So uh, I would go with the standard setup before we get creative and saying, oh, it's uh, characterization and, and stuff like that, or overlapping. Uh, we'll, we'll save the party for the lower anterior six, if anything. The uppers, let's see if we can set it up straight. The lateral will be laid off laid off to the distal and the canine which is the most important tooth in the setup and i'm drawing it two-dimensionally but the canine actually turns the corner and that's why it is the corner tooth uh and the corner tooth now is the segue darwinistically between incisors and posteriors you know the cingulum of the canine slowly evolves to the lingual cusp of the first bicuspid smaller one and then larger on the second this is the corner tooth this is going to be the most difficult one to set up never mind the most difficult one to draw for me because <laughs> they all come in different shapes and sizes here so maybe i'm going to put this angle this way there we go i made a mess of my canine and a mess of my plane of occlusion. It should be touching the plane. Now, when I, this one here is laid off slightly too. You see the line angle is laid off to the distal. The line angle is laid off to the distal slightly, pretty much straight up and down. Now, this is gonna vary between the tooth molds, the tooth manufacturer, Naturally, with uh, elderly patients, they have a canine which is flatter. They might even have incisal attrition that's flatter, but this will start with the standard setup before we go and altering things. Once we have all six anterior teeth in, then I'm going to set up six, so this side's already done. Have that checked or quickly looked at. Again, review from last year, but this is the new year. We've got some a long central. A long lateral, which is smaller than my central, so we'll have to shorten this one. Then we'll make this one bigger. Lateral slightly wider. And then the canine. Slightly enough. So this is straight up and down. Straight up and down. Maybe angled this way slightly, laid off inwards. Depending on the mold and what it looks like and the incisal edge. 
then naturally the canine is going to fit between the lateral and this canine because the teeth are engineered and measured uh, that they will fit with one another. Now naturally when we get into situations next case with class 2 and class 3 we might order smaller anterior teeth in the class 2 or larger anterior teeth on the lower for the class 3. We can mix and match a little bit. But this is my goal for you today is get all six teeth set up in the right line angles with the correct, where did my sheet go? With the correct overbite and overjet. Now, how do we check that this just near missing and no colliding? What we're going to do is once we have six teeth set up, and maybe we need to demonstrate this in the class, I think, or one-on-one, -on -one, we will release of these condyle locks on both sides. Not all the way, please don't unscrew them so they Let me get my uh, occlusion rim off here. I haven't destroyed it by seeing it together, just a small bit of wax. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna move our anterior uh, guidance before any posterior teeth in. If we've got collisions in the anterior before the posterior teeth here, right? And what happens is you can see the back of the occlusion rims opening up. Chapter eight, we're gonna talk about this probably more formally in the PowerPoints, but it's easier to visualize it. This is Christensen's phenomenon. Because two plates don't slide forward. There's an angle upwards because of the condylar guidance at 30 degrees. Maybe I could put mine at 30 degrees. That would help us, wouldn't it? I was at 35. Okay, there we go. 30 degrees. So this here, this opening of the posterior section, you guessed it, that's how much compensating curve. Right? Compensating curve will change due to the amount of condylar guidance we have. Now last year, for your compensating curve, and we'll talk about this next week, but quickly, if I do four, five, six, seven, lower plane of occlusion, plane of occlusion, and slightly upwards in this direction. How much compensating curve? Well, it depends on the condylar guidance. Higher condylar guidance, more compensating curve. Compensating curve because we need these contacts in protrusive. Maybe I've gone a little bit too far, but it, to remind you, last year uh, you set up the uppers first. This year we're going to set up the lowers. A little change of pace. The result is the same. Don't panic. Most of you won't get it and say, oh, I like doing the uppers first. And I say, okay, do the uppers. And then you'll still struggle a little bit. Not that I want you to, but I've been here longer than you. Last year, okay, this is a mess of a drawing. I'm getting tired here. Last year, you did the cusp tips of four, five, and mesial, excuse me, the mesial buckle cusp of six. Touches the plane. And then distal buckle cusp, mesial buckle cusp, distal buckle cusp of seven touches this plane, right? And then I think you did half, one, and one and a half millimeter. Well, that's fine and dandy, but that's not going to work depending on every condylar guidance. Um, but this is a good practice and a rule of thumb, and it's probably very close. You know, I don't want to discredit it at all. It's very close on the 20-degree tooth setup in class one. And this is a, uh, propagated by uh, Densply uh, in the early days of their denture setup manuals. And this is what I learned when I went to school. And this is what you still learn when you went to school. And this is still in Al McCormick's uh, textbook. And is still in many denture setup. Although I would go with the lower. And the condylar guidance will dictate my compensating curve. Now. What I'm going to do when we get to the lowers, I'm going to have you set up on a flat plane first. If we can't set up on a flat plane, we can't put compensating curve. And hopefully those setup planes that we ordered will be in. You'll set up the uppers on the flat plane, and then you'll do this movement. And then you'll know how much compensating curve. Because you say, how much compensating curve? And I'll say, that much. How much is that? I don't know it's that much. If we look here, millimeter and a half at the back, just like Mr. McCormick's last year. So... I went too far on the posterior teeth, but giving you a big picture and we'll dial it back. Mounting of the model, nice and neat and clean. If you botch it, just knock it off and do it again. Overbite, overjet, 
anterior 12, today would be a good goal. If you're behind, that's fine. You've got some things to do. If you're a little ahead, that's fine too. If you find yourself with nothing to do, we've always got models project two coming out by the end of the day. And you guessed it, custom trays, bite blocks for bite registration in a class two setup. And then we'll repeat and repeat and repeat. Class three, lingualized, immediate, class one, and uh, lingualized occlusion with implants. So those are our five cases. We've got lots to do, not to uh, worry you. If we don't get to the end, that's fine, but let's proceed and progress uh, appropriately. Okay, thanks.